you have the power to give him to me i am simply your servant running behind you shouting krishna krishna shila sachidananda bhaktana thakur ki jai
The word anikirtaya is very significant. Anikirtaya means to follow the description, not to create a concocted mental description, but to follow. Shavanagarishi requested Sutta Goswami to describe what he had actually heard from his spiritual master Shukadeva Goswami about the transcendental pastimes of the Lord manifested by his internal energy. Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, has no material body, but he can assume any kind of body by his supreme will that is made possible by his internal energy. Om Gyan Timiran Vasya Gyan Anjana Shalakaya Chakshur Anmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha 
जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गाथ श्रीवासि गौर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम Today is the auspicious appearance day of Bhakti Nur Thakur Mahasaya. We will discuss from Shrimad Bhagavatam this particular verse, and then we will hear the glories of Bhakti Nur Thakur. As we can see in this purport, the word Anukritya is very significant, very important. because we are following in disciplic succession we are following in parampara where the knowledge the truth is being passed down from guru to disciple we are not here to concoct we are not here to present our own ideas or to have some innovation in terms of knowledge rather we are simply following in footsteps of previous acharyas so this purport looks very significant for today's presentation because today is the avadha mahotsav of sachidananda bhakti vinod thakur as we can see here shavanagari she requested suta goswami as he had heard from his spiritual master shila shagadev goswami in the same way we can see the life and teachings of shila bhakti vinod thakur how he presented the eternal teachings of lord krishna and lord chaitanya and how shila prabhupad eventually followed in the footsteps of this great acharya shila bhakti vinod thakur so today's class will be primarily focused on the life and teaching of bhakti vinod thakur so i will try to read the pranam mantra for bhakti vinod thakur as we are all familiar with i can read line by line and you can repeat after me namo bhakti vinodaya namo bhakti vinodaya sachidananda namine sachidananda sachidanand bhakti vinod who is transcendental energy of chaitanya mahaprabhu he is a strict follower of the goswamis headed by shrila rupa goswami so here even in this verse the connection to parampara is very clearly established two primary points one is bhakti vinod thakur is representing the eternal tradition that is coming from chaitanya mahaprabhu through the goswami subrandavan headed by shila rupa goswami second bhakti vinod thakur is invested with the energy the internal potency of sri chaitanya mahaprabhu so today in this talk we will see how bhakti vinod thakur uh, emanated this transcendental energy of sri chaitanya mahaprabhu in fact if you see the life of bhakti vinod thakur you can see he was a great visionary he established the birthplace of sri chaitanya mahaprabhu he was a prolific writer he authored many books and many song books many many songs he removed many of the misconceptions that were present during his time about devotional service And at that time mahaprabhu's teachings were almost lost and at that point bhakti vinod thakur established the teachings of lord chaitanya and also he uh, exposed many pseudo incarnations who were present at this time so today we will 
try to see the life of Bhakti Thakur and his teachings. And to start with, we will look into <coughs> the historical moment in which Bhakti Thakur appeared. It is very significant. Because in 1486, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared and he had his contemporaries. Later, all the Goswamis taught the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Then some great Acharyas appeared who followed in the footsteps of Lord Chaitanya and the Goswamis who continued the eternal teachings of Lord Chaitanya. However, when about 200 years passed, things changed. Even though Mahaprabhu firmly established that the real medicine, the real panacea for this disease of Bhavarog in the age of Kali is chanting of Hare Krishna Mahamantra. This congregational chanting was almost lost and the pure teachings of Lord Chaitanya was almost lost. That is the period in which Bhakti Thakur appeared. The British Raj, the rulers of British government and the educated Indians, they considered Vaishnavas to be just mendicants, mm -hmm. people who had no value, just beggars in the street. And they considered the Vaishnavas to be just sentimentalists. And indeed, many of the so-called Vaishnavas acted in a very improper manner. To, uh, to emphasize and to highlight this particular historical movement, even most of the authoritative scriptures were almost lost. Bhaktivinoda Thakur had to search for more than eight years to get a bona fide copy of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, the historical narration of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, along with his teachings. He had to wait for eight years to get a copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Now, if you see, if you go to any homes of the devotees or if you go to ashram, you find multiple copies of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. In the ashram, maybe in each room, there will be one copy of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. And if we have all the smartphones, we can see everyone has a copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita handy. And at that time, Bhakti Nath Thakur had to wait for more than 8 years to get a bona fide copy of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. So we can understand how the teachings of Lord Chaitanya was misconstrued by unworthy people. And in 1838, Bhakti Thakur appeared as Kedarnath Datta in the village of Ulagrama in the district of Nadia in West Bengal. And he was the seventh son of Raja Krishnanand Datta. So in fact, if you try to understand the birth of Bhakti Thakur, he had a very aristocratic birth. He was born in a wealthy family. He recollects that in his family, he had hundreds of servants who were ready to serve Bhakti Thakur. Mm -hmm. So this was the wealthy position of the family of Bhakti Thakur. So, so many servants, so much of wealth, so much of land, everything. But interestingly enough, Bhakti Nath Thakur had to see both sides of the coin. He had to see the ups and he had to see the down. So at point, at the time of birth, Bhakti Nath Thakur was very rich. But later, we see that he had to go through really a poverty-stricken situation. It's mentioned that after in 1849 when he was 11 years old his father passed away and after that they had to go through a poverty stricken situation so they lost all the money and that time even Bhakti Nath Thakur was quite philosophical he started thinking what is, it, what is this life all about? What is the meaning of life? Why such turmoil is going through in our family, in my life? So Bhakti Vinod Thakur was quite philosophical. Even though Bhakti Thakur is 
an eternal servant of the Lord, a Nitya Siddha, eternally perfect devotee, he manifested himself the past time in which he found himself to be a seeker, just like an ordinary person would go through difficulties and then he would start thinking, what is this life all about? In the same way, Bhaktinoda Thakur started thinking, what is this life all about? And he also went through different literature. He went through Ramayana, Mahabharata, different other Puranas. He went through Kali Purana, Anadamangal. He went through all different scriptures and finally he came in touch with the teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. It is mentioned that he also very thoroughly studied Quran and Bible. And when he would lecture or when, when he had conversation, he could thoroughly quote Quran and Bible. So he was well versed in all the Puranas. He was well versed in Bible and Quran. So he had a very vast knowledge of religious scriptures in general. So he was examining different scriptures. So as I explained earlier, he was just like a seeker who would go through different scriptures and would try to find out what is the highest scripture. So he went through all the scriptures, including the Vedic literatures and non-Vedic literatures. Interestingly enough, he came up with one conclusion that he had studied Shankaracharya's monistic philosophy, Advaita Vat, the impersonalism. And he had also studied Christianity. So he was attracted more to Christianity than impersonalism. Because he found the theology of Christianity to be less offensive to the Lord in comparison to Shankaracharya's Advaita philosophy. So it's interesting that he was more attracted to Christianity. And even from his childhood, he had the mood of service. Because he was a bo born in a big family, he had many siblings. And of all the siblings, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was looking a bit ugly. He was not very handsome in comparison to his other brothers. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur's mother told him that you can act as a servant of all. Mm -hmm. And in that way you live long and you be a servant of all your siblings. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur took that mood. He acted as a servant of all the living entities as a perfect Vaishnava. As you know, Bhaktina Thakur, his writings are just so amazing. If you see his life, he was a brilliant student. He mastered English language. He mastered writing and he could compose beautiful poems. In fact, he mastered many languages. Bengali, Odia, then uh, English, Persian, like that. Many la contemporary languages he mastered and he could read, write and he became an authority in those languages. He could write, he had such a command on those languages. So he was amazing. He was a brilliant, he was a genius from birth. So he said he started, as he grew up, he had his education. As he grew up, he started thinking, what should be my profession? <laughs> so he found that business, he considered himself to be a businessman. Then he thought, to be a businessman means there has to be some inherent <coughs> dishonesty. If some, somebody is completely honest, then one cannot be a businessman. So he considered business is not for me. I have to take some honest occupation. Then he said, he was very good in language, so he, he got the profession as a teacher. And later he became a head, headmaster, he grew up in his profession. And ultimately, he became a district magistrate under British Raj. So it is considered very, very difficult for an Indian to come up to such a high position under the gov governors of the British. Because they don't want any Indian to come up to such a level, such a high position. But Bhaktivinoda Thakur was so talented and he was being admired by all the colleagues and all the British officials that they recommended him to get such a high position. 
So we will see his life, we will see uh, his ethics and morality. It is amazing. So now, uh, there are a few interesting pastimes of Bhakti Thakur. So one of the pastimes is very relevant even to the current times. The reason is, in India, still there are so many pseudo-incarnations. Even to, to, to till date, there are so many pseudo-incarnations. So many people who claim them, themselves to be incarnations of God. So even at that time, we had to consider this is about 150 years back, even then there were pseudo-incarnations in Bengal. So it is said that this is particularly in Orissa. In 1873, there was one such pseudo-incarnation. Yeah, his name is Bishaki Sen. Bishaki Sen. We might have heard about him, Bishaki Sen. Very notorious in many ways. <laughs> so, he became so famous among the villagers because of his mystic siddhis. He had many mystic powers and because of his mystic powers he became very famous because the villagers were, many of them were uneducated and they didn't know. And others who were educated, they couldn't distinguish between a real incarnation and a pseudo-incarnation. So his powers were very interesting. If there is a fire, there is a big fire lighting up, he could sit erect and in between he could lean toward the fire, into the flames of the fire and he could be in the flame of the fire for some time and then he could come back without getting injured. He could produce fire from his mouth and he had dreadlocks and sometimes from the dreadlocks the fire, the sparks will come. This was his power. And he had the mystical powers to cure diseases. So if some villagers would come, then they would go glorify Vishakhi Sen as the Supreme Lord himself and he would give some basma, some ashes and soon the incurable disease would vanish forever. So Vishakhi Sen was very powerful and obviously he became very popular. And he made a very important declaration. He said, I am Mahavishnu. I am Mahavishnu and I have appeared for a purpose. So he was very clear about his incarnation and the mission of the incarnation. As Shastra would say, any incarnation doesn't appear just like that. There is always a mission statement. In the same way, Vishakhi Sen also told he has a mission statement. He said his mission statement is that he would appear in the four-handed Vishnu form and he would sent all the Britishers away from India. So he, that was his power. He said all the Britishers would be defeated in a war and all of them will flee away from India. So since he made this proclamation, the British government, they became a bit worried. So they wanted to investigate the matter because this look, looked like a political uprising. And he, they thought we had to take some action against this Vishakhi Sen. So they appointed Bhakti Nath Thakur to do this. So Bhakti Nath Thakur was appointed to investigate Vishakhi Sen and find out the matter and to arrest him. So this is a big task. It's very challenging because he had thousands of followers mm -hmm. and he had his mystical powers. So practically no one could touch him because he can produce fire from his body and people were very scared to go near him and he had the power to curse people so how can anyone go near Vishakhi Sen? but Bhakti Thakur is a great devotee of the Lord as you know devotees of the Lord are fearful sorry fearless so as a fearless Bhakti Thakur he went with hundreds of constables to arrest Vishakhi Sen. so it is said as uh, he went to Vishakhi Sen, Bhakti Thakur investigated among villagers what's really going on. So some of them were glorifying Vishakhi Sen. They were saying he is the Supreme Lord himself. 
and some others told that some of their wives were kept by Bishaki Sen and in nights he used to perform Rasa Lila so Rasa dance <laughs> and he used to engage in illicit, uh, illicit affairs with this woman so <laughs> there was a lot of problems in the village because many of the women being abused by Bishaki Sen so Bhakti Nautaku took this into serious consideration so Bhakti Nautaku went with all these constables to arrest Bishaki Sen and in fact when Bhakti Nautaku met Bishaki Sen Bhakti Nautaku told Bishaki Sen that you have to surrender and you have to come with me to Puri so Bishaki Sen denied he had the mystical power he said I know who you are you are the magistrate Bhakti Nautaku and I know that you have kept many constables hidden in the forest in the jungle because this yogi was not living in a town or a village he was in the jungle living with his associates where always there used to be a sacrificial fire and he used to sit near that so he refused to stay in the city or in the village or in the town but only in the jungle so Bhakti Nautaku had already arranged many constables around him in the jungle so Bishak is saying he could read the mind he told everything and he also told that you are a great devotee you are a very nice devotee and he said that great supreme lord is none other than me I am Mahavishnu and in fact there is a trinity there was a Mahavishnu the maintainer and there was a Brahma and there was a Sadashiv all three appeared so Bishak Sen was not alone there was a trinity at that time <laughs> Brahma, Vishnu and Lord Shiva all of them passed there as incarnations then Bishak Sen had audacity to say that I am Mahavishnu and also he said I am coming from the Kshirodaka ocean I am coming from the milk ocean <laughs> so Bishak Sen told Bhakti Nur Thakur I am coming from the milk ocean <laughs> And he told Bhakti Thakur that I will remove all the Europeans from India. <laughs> I have the power to do that. And it is just a matter of time. I can do anything. And in front of Bishak in front of Bhakti Thakur, Bishak Sen started showing different magics, different siddhis. He took people, the villagers were there, they were pouring into the presence of Bishak Sen. So he cured different diseases, he produced fire. So he did different magics in front of Bhakti Thakur, but Bhakti Thakur was not at all impressed. He considered Bishak Sen just as an offender at the lotus feet of the Lord. And he was very much determined to arrest Bishak Sen because he is claiming himself to be God, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Bishak Sen was there in this forest. Bhakti Thakur asked Bishak Sen, why are you living in the forest? Mm. If you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you have to be in Jagannath Puri. Mm. Because the Lord is never in the forest. He is always living in the palace. Because he is the possessor of all the six opulences. So why are you in the forest? Why not come to Jagannath Puri? I have come here to take you to Jagannath Puri. So why not come with me? So, Bishak Sen again offended the Supreme Lord. He said, what's the use of Jagannath? Jagannath is just a plank of wood that's it no, I am the supreme lord and he said Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is my dear devotee <laughs> so this was the proclamations made by <laughs> Bishaki Sen the Bhakti Nur Thakur was very much offended. offended by such statement he was very angry what is, what is really going on so and uh, finally he said you are, you are also my devotee so, Bhakti Nur Thakur you are also my devotee and when the Hindu kingdom would be established in India, I will give you a big position. I will make you the governor of Orissa. <laughs> so in that way, he tried to allure Bhakti Thakur by offering some position. Bhakti Thakur was definitely least interested in such statement. And he came up with so many policemen near this mystic yogi. So many of the followers started fleeing away because they were afraid. Because these uh, police, they had rifles, they, had, they were armed. So the local people, they started fleeing away. And Bishak Sen, he became very angry. 
he said to Bhaktivinoda Thakur that if I become angry by the fire of my anger, I can burn all the three worlds into ashes. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing this, Bhaktivinoda Thakur started laughing. <laughs> he said, Acha, then you come me, with me to Puri. There you can show your anger. You can Then you can burn all the three worlds into ashes. But now you come with me. So he arranged a bullock cart. <laughs> And all the policemen took him, he said, okay, now you come and you can sit in the bullock cart. So, there was a bit of time gap between, he sent the policeman to get a bullock cart and, uh, you know, he, he told him, okay, I'm going to arrest him. At that point, Bhaktino Thakur started preaching to this Vishakis and he said, why are you offending at the Lord's feet of the Lord? You are not Vishnu. You, you are the, the purpose of whole life is to surrender unto the Supreme Lord. Why are you falsely climbing yourself? To be the Supreme Lord. It doesn't make any sense. But of course, Bishak Sen was least ready to listen from Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So, he was, you know, now he's being arrested and he's going to be put in the bullock cart. That time, <laughs> Bishak Sen made a very classic statement. He said, ultimately, I am the Supreme Lord and you are my dear devotee. And because of that, the Supreme Lord is complete, completely subjugated, completely captured by the love of his devotee. So since you are telling me <laughs> to, <laughs> to sit in the bullock cart, so I agree. I will sit in the bullock cart and I am ready to go to Jagannath Puri. <laughs> so he used all this logic and finally he sat in the bullock cart and along with the constables he was taken to Puri. So there they decided to uh, do to do the trial for this Vishakhi Singh. So it is mentioned that on the way to Jagannath Puri, where Bhaktivinoda Thakur was also in the Bullock Cup, he started writing the all the trial, all the documents, all the evidences against Bishaki Singh. So we can see even Bhaktivinoda Thakur, we will see his uh, how he utilized the time so efficiently and effectively. We can see even when he was traveling from uh, this place, from Orissa to this place, Orissa to Jagannath Puri, he was making all the notes. So he was ready for the trial. So finally, he was brought uh, in front of the judge and you know, Bhakti Thakur is, he has to uh, pass the judgment. The trial went on for 18 days. How many days? 18 days. So you can understand. It's a, it's a big thing. It's a historic event. Because thousands of followers of this yogi, they assembled. They surrounded the court. And they were telling, they were shouting, the injustice is going on in this world. Bishak Hussain must be released right now. So, you know, there was a big following for this Bishak Hussain. <coughs> so it is mentioned, as the fifth day of the trial, Bishak Hussain made an announcement. Bishak Hussain told Bhaktino Thakur that if you don't release me, I am threatening you there is going to be a great mishap happening to your family. So it is better for you to release me right now. Stop this trial and release me. Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, no. And as the yogi predicted, as he went home, a great mishap was about to take place. That was Bhaktivinoda Thakur's daughter, seven-year-old daughter, Kadambini, she fell sick. And the, the sickness was so severe that Kalambini was about to die. So, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's wife, Bhagavati Devadasi, she told Bhaktivinoda Thakur, just please release Bishakhi Singh. Let our family be saved from the curse of this yogi. Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, even if all of us die, still I will not release Bishakhi Singh. Because he is an offender at the lotus feet of Krishna. So I will never release him. He must be punished. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur was so strict. And finally, the last day of the trial, this yogi told that, even you will die because of my curse. So I told the last day when Bhaktivinoda Thakur went, he had such a severe pain. Bhaktivinoda Thakur felt that he is going to die. Such a severe pain and he couldn't even make it to the court. 
So he was struggling just to get into the court and finally with all the pain, Bhaktivinoda Thakur went to the court and he passed the judgment that he will be punished for a year and a half. So that was the punishment, imprisonment for a year, year and a half. At that point, <coughs> Yogi became so angry and from his dreadlocks, fire started coming. <laughs> Everyone was scared, but Bhaktivinoda Thakur was least bothered by such magical feats. At that time, there was an English officer, he used to study a lot about different mystical yogis. Mm -hmm. So, what he did, as, he, as the, the, the trial was finished and the judgment was passed, this Englishman, he took a big scissors, must be a really large scissor, mm -hmm. he went and he started cutting the <laughs> hair, dreadlocks of this Vishakisen. <laughs> and in no time, he didn't have any hair on his head. That time, Bishak is saying, even though all these 18 days, Bishak is saying, didn't eat anything, he didn't drink anything, but he had full energy, but when his dreadlock was completely removed, he actually fell, he collapsed. Then, he was taken in a stretcher from the court to the prison house. So it is said that all the mystic yogis, they store their energy, the mystical energies in the Dreadlocks yes. in the hair, in the dreadlocks. He had a long hair and it was full of energy, all full of mystical energy. So now he had no energy. And it is said, three months he spent in the jail. After that, the pseudo incarnation committed suicide by drinking poison. That was the end of Bishakisen. It is said, soon after that, one another Balaram came about. He was also arrested. And there was another Brahma who took charge of Bishak Sen's group, he was also arrested. So in that way, Bhakti Nath Thakur, he removed all these misconceptions, who, all these pseudo incarnation who were offenders at the lotus feet of Krishna. So it is said, Bhakti Nath Thakur played such a great role in re-establishing the pure teachings of Lord Chaitanya. He removed the obstacles in the path of devotion by this pseudo incarnations and pseudo swamis who would cheat people claiming themselves to be God. It is mentioned that Bhaktinath Thakur, when he was staying in Puri, he, you know, we had to see, even though he said Nitya Siddha, he enacted himself as a sadhaka who is steadily progressing in his devotional service. So Bhaktinath Thakur himself writes that I made most of my spiritual progress why staying in Jagannath Puri? Because of the holy association of many Paramahamsa Babajis. So in Jagannath Puri, Bhaktinath Thakur uh, started an association, a society called Bhagavad Samsar. And in Bhagavad Samsar, there, it was a group of devotees, they would assemble in Jagannath Vallabh Gardens. Because Jagannath Vallabh Gardens is the bhajan place of Ramananda Roy, the associate of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So there, Bhaktivinoda Thakur and all great devotees would assemble and they will discuss about Krishna. So all the great devotees of Jagannath Puri used to come to Jagannath Balabha Garden and they used to discuss. But one Babaji, his name was Jagannath Das Babaji, he never came to this assembly. And he started dissuading others not to go to this assembly. He considered that Bhaktivinoda Thakur never wore Vaishnav Tilak, nor he had Kantimala. So since he didn't have Vaishnav Tilak and Kantimala, they started saying, he is not a real devotee. So he is representing some upper sampradaya. He is not giving the pure teachings of the Lord. So we shouldn't go and associate with him. So this Raghunath Das Babaji, he was afflicted by a great disease. He was severely sick. And one night, Lord Jagannath himself came into the dream of Raghunath Das Babaji and told Raghunath Das that if you want to be cured from this serious illness, you had to go and you had to ask forgiveness from Bhaktinoda Thakur for your offense, otherwise you will die. <laughs> so then Raghunath Das Babaji, next day he got up and he went and fall at the feet of Bhaktinoda Thakur and asked for forgiveness. And Bhaktinoda Thakur as a magnanimous Vaishnava, he completely forgave all the offences he had committed. It was, it was more verbal. He forgave all the offences. And Bhaktinoda Thakur gave some medicines. And in due course of time, Babaji was 
relieved from his disease. And it is said, Bhakti Thakur says, this Babaji was actually a Paramahamsa. He was actually a Nitya Siddha. He said, this is also a Nitya Siddha Babaji. So we can see, even such a thing happened, how the Lord interferes and he actually rectifies the situation. The Lord doesn't want his pure devotee to be offended. So it shows the greatness of Bhakti Thakur. In fact, the, it is mentioned that one time Bhakti Thakur was uh, sitting in Jagannath Puri in the Jagannath Mandir. Ja Bhakti Thakur used to go to Jagannath Puri Mandir pretty much every day and he used to sit and he used to do bhajan in Jagannath Puri in the Jagannath Mandir. Near Mukti Mandar, there used to be a lot of Brahmanas who would assemble and who would talk about Mayava philosophy. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur was very much offended by such activities. It is said that by the association of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, many of these Mayavadis, they became devotees. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur used to recite Srimad Bhagavatam in the assembly of devotees in Bhakti Mandap in Puri, where Mahaprabhu and Sarva Bhattacharya enacted their pastimes. So, one day, Bhakti Vinod Thakur was reciting Srimad Bhagavatam along with the devotees. Then the king of Puri appeared there. He came with all his antaraj and he was creating such a havoc, such a noise. And Bhakti Nath Thakur was greatly offended by the act of King of Puri. And Bhakti Nath Thakur directly chastised the King of Puri. He told King of Puri that you may be a king of a small kingdom, but Lord Jagannath is the Lord of the universe. And Srimad Bhagavatam is the eternal scripture. So you must pay all respects to the devotees and Srimad Bhagavatam. So King of Puri was taken aback and he paid respectful obeisances unto the devotees and Srimad Bhagavatam. So he had to surrender at the feet of Bhakti Thakur. So this is interesting that how Bhakti Thakur was very determined when it comes to preaching, when it comes to <coughs> upholding the standards of Vaishnavism. It's mentioned, we hear there that Bhakti Thakur was not uh, initiated when he was staying in Puri. Later, Bhakti Thakur got initiated by Bibin Bihari Goswami. He was coming from the Sampradaya, coming from uh, Janava Mata, the dear wife of Nityananda Prabhu. And later, in terms of his Diksha, he got his Diksha from Vivin Bihari Goswami, but he got his Shiksha from Jagannathas Baba Maharaj. So that's why we see he was very deeply, very intimately connected to Jagannathas Babaji. So that's why when we see the Parampara, we can see next to Bhakti Thakur, we see the painting of Jagannathas Babaji. Because the mood of worship, the teachings of Jagannathas Babaji was very, very inspirational to Bhakti Thakur. So they had a very intimate association and also we will see their intimate association when Bhakti Thakur discovered the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. It is said one time the king of Jagannath Puri, king of Puri, the king of Orissa became very very envious to Bhakti Thakur. Why? Because in 1874 the Raja mis misused 80,000 rupees. You had to understand, in 1874, 80,000 rupees was misused by the king. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur found out and he passed the judgment that king had to offer 52 times per day the bhoga to Lord Jagannath. This was the punishment. <laughs> but it's a very good punishment if you consider ourselves to be a devotees. You had to go to Lord Jagannath and offer 52 times. <laughs> Practically the whole day the service of the king is going to be just offering bhoga to the Lord. All time in the kitchen and the altar. Every half an hour. Every half an hour or more. The king has to be in the temple. He cannot do anything else. And he had to do this for I think at least one year. 
he has to do this service. <laughs> so this was a punishment passed by Bhaktivinoda Thakur for misappropriating the Lord's wealth. So the king was extremely angry <laughs> with this punishment <laughs> because he was just an enjoyer. <laughs> so he he thought I want to kill Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So he was devising a plot to kill Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So he understood, I cannot directly approach or kill Bhaktivinoda Thakur. He had, because he was in the British Raj, he was in a high post and at the same time he had such a big following. So if he tried to directly attack Bhaktivinoda Thakur, his position will be in danger. So he didn't want to take any direct steps. So what he did, he organized a 30 days yajna, a 30 days fire sacrifice. And for this fire sacrifice, he appointed 50 Brahmanas. <laughs> so they would do this sacrifice in the Tantra format. And every day they will offer different oblations into the fire. And the, the ultimate result is that at the end of 30th day, when the final oblations are poured into the fire, Bhaktivinoda would be dead. So this was the system. This was the arrangement. Patino Thakur, he was, uh, you know, he is an administrator. He is very smart. So he knew what is going on. But he was least bothered by this act. He didn't do anything. He just continued his bhajan. He continued his chanting of Hare Krishna Mahamantra. He continued reading Srimad Bhagavatam. And he didn't do anything about it. So on the 30th day, when this priest offered the, fly, fly, the final oblation into the fire, instead of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, the king's own son was dead. And that was a big thing. Then the king was completely devastated and he learned the lesson. Trying to kill a pure devotee of the Lord. So we can see how the Supreme Lord always protects his pure devotees. And no one could do anything. Rather, the, if they try to curse or if they try to punish or to try to kill such a pure devotee, it is reversed. Everything is coming back upon themselves. Just like Durvasamani and Ambarish Maharaj. Because Ambarish, Durvasamani tried to kill Ambarish Maharaj by producing a demon. And, but what happened? But, and did Ambarish Maharaj do anything to protect himself? He did nothing. He continued his bhajan. But the Lord protected. So in the same way, Bhaktivinoda Thakur didn't do anything to protect himself, but the Lord took care. So instead of Bhaktivinoda Thakur being killed, the king's own son got killed. So this is a very significant lesson. And a very important contribution. So all these things actually established, helped to establish the pure teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Because we will see further that how Bhaktino Thakur brought so many books and he established the teachings of Lord Chaitanya and he removed different obstacles in the path of devotion. And another very important contribution of Bhaktino Thakur is discovering the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. Because Mahabharu appeared in 1786 and after that, years, sorry, 1486, after that, centuries have passed and devotees didn't know where Mahabrabhu took place, took birth. Right. And in fact, people started saying that Nadia was the birthplace of Mahabrabhu. So many people stayed in Nadia days, they wanted Nadia to be the place of pilgrimage. So they just proclaimed that Nadia is the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. And Mahabhatino Thakur, one day, he, he was sleeping in Tarakeshwar. And in, when Mahabhatino Thakur was sleeping in Tarakeshwar, there was a dream. In that dream, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself appeared. And Lord Chaitanya told Mahabhatino Thakur, I understand your desire to go to Vrindavan. You can go to Vrindavan, but before that, you have to perform a very important act. That is to finding out my, birth, my birthplace. So please do that. After that, you can go to Vrindavan. So after this, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was completely enthusiastic to perform his mission, to find 
the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya because that is very very significant for his time of devotees and his followers. We can see now there is a place of worship in Mayapur for Lord Chaitanya. It is by the mercy of Bhakti Nath Thakur. However, Bhakti Nath Thakur he has to do serious research. If you try to understand the character of Bhakti Nath Thakur, it is mentioned Bhakti Nath Thakur is just like Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Parikshit he asks so many specific questions, so many detailed questions to get answers from Shukadev Goswami. He was like a thorough researcher. Whatever he studied, he was so thorough in his study. He would study, in fact, exhaustively and he could come to the right conclusions. Let it be about Shastra, let it be about uh, the cases that he deal with in the court, or let it be history, or let it be the history of the place. So he could, he could study anything very, very thoroughly and systematically. We can see in his writings how systematically Bhakti Nath Thakur would present anything. So now, when it comes to the uh, to f uh, finding the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya, he took this same approach. He was so logical, he was so rational, and he studied everything thoroughly. So one time, Bhakti Nath Thakur, he was he went to different local residents of Mayapur and Nadia, and he started inquiring. So some of them said that birthplace of Lord Chaitanya is Navadip and some told that the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya is lost because Ganges has changed its course. So now there is no more birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> so Bhakti Thakur was completely dissatisfied with both these answers. So he wanted really to find where is this birthplace. He travelled around. Now they we traveled around in Mayapur, but he couldn't find the birthplace. He asked many people, but he couldn't find. But one day he was camping, one interesting thing happened. One Saturday evening, the Thakur was sitting on the roof of the Rani Tharmashala in Navadiv with his third son Kamala Prasad and a friend who was a clerk, and along with a, along with a friend who was a clerk. It was 10 o'clock in the night, very dark. As the sky was covered with clouds, the Thaku gives account. Across the Ganges, in the northern direction, I saw a large mansion flooded with light. When I, when I asked Kamal about this, he confirmed that he had seen it also. When I asked the clerk, he said, I didn't see anything. I was utterly amazed by that. This is Bhakti Nath Thakur is writing. I was utterly amazed by that. When I looked carefully, at that area in the morning from the roof of Rani's house, I saw a thar, a palm tree located there. Inquiring from others about the place, they said it was known as Balali, <coughs> Balali Ki, which was near the ruins of the old fort and kingdom of Lakshman Sen. Upon inquiring of various persons, Thakur learned that adjacent to this place was the large pond of King Balal Sen from which the town got its name. And aside from that, there was nothing of importance. The following Saturday, he went to Balal Diki, where at night he again had a wonderful vision. He spent the next day wandering all over the site. The elderly locals told him that this was indeed the location of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's birth. They pointed out an extensive mound covered with Tulsi plant as a site of his appearance. So, first, Bhakti Nath Thakur had this vision from now that he could see a large light and a mansion in the site of, in the site of birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. Second, when he went, he found, found the local villagers who some of them, elderly people, they told this is the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. And there was a mound, there was only Tulsi plant was growing. It is said that they tried to remove the Tulsi, but they couldn't. It was only one plant was growing that was Tulsi at that area. So this was the second confirmation. First, he could see his vision. Second, there was some confirmation in terms of Tulsi plant and the local villagers. But he was not just satisfied. This is very interesting because someone would get satisfied with, okay, I understood, okay, this must be the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya, but Bhaktinur Thakur was not satisfied with that. He continued his research. 
he took different old manuscripts and he started to inquire about this place and he found out that in the old maps this place was known as Mayapur so he got the map of Ganga Govinda Singh and other kings who ruled the centuries before and they found he found that this was actually this place was actually known as Mayapur and then finally he found a scriptural reference so he didn't just take it for granted rather he found a scriptural reference in Bhakti Ratnakara it is you know the Narayana Sarka he has written the Bhakti Ratnakara in, it, in which there is a statement Navadiva Mathe Mayapur Namstan Yathara Janami Lena Gorachandra Bhagavan in the center of Navadiv, there is a place called Mayapur. At this place, the Supreme Lord Gorachandra took his birth. So then he understood this old map, there is a place known as Mayapur. He found Mayapur where it is. And he could get a scriptural reference where this name of Mayapur is already mentioned. Still, Bhakti Thakur was not satisfied with this. As a final confirmation, he approached his spiritual master, Jagannath Das Babaji. So what he did, Jagannath Das Babaji was 120 years old at that time and he couldn't walk, he couldn't stand, he was completely lean, he was almost like crushed, like a small baby because he was so lean forward, he couldn't stand, he was taken in a basket because of his old age, he couldn't even walk. So one person carried Jagannath Das Babaji in a basket and they started walking through Mayapur. So the point when they reached the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya, Jagannathas Babaji leaped up in ecstasy and he started crying out, Eto Nimai Chama Bhumi. Jumped out from the basket. And from the air. He jumped, leaped in the air and he started dancing and he started crying out, Eto Nimai Chama Bhumi. <laughs> this is indeed the birthplace of Lord Nimai. So from this, Bhakti Thakur confirmed, okay, this must be the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya because ultimately he cross-checked from his spiritual master, Jagannath Das Babaji. So he heard from some sadhus, he saw the history, he found scriptural evidence and also he confirmed from his own spiritual master. And interestingly enough, I just say Jagannath Das Babaji couldn't see anything. He was blind. So even, even, even though he was blind, he yeah, he couldn't even open the eyes, he was blind. So he, at that point, when the, he reached this point, he jumped out and he started crying out. This is the birthplace of our Nimai. So that's how Pakhina Thakur uh, confirmed the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. And it's very interesting, after retirement, Pakhina Thakur wanted this place to be worshipped and he wanted to establish the deities of Lord Chaitanya at the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. For that, he went on a mission and the mission was to was fundraising. So, he didn't have a fundraising dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Bhakti Thakur's fundraising technique was very interesting. What was it? He would collect only one rupee from one family. He went house to house in thousands and thousands of houses in Calcutta and he would beg for just one rupees, that's all. And he would collect only, even though wealthy to people, they may be ready to offer more money, he wouldn't collect. So his idea was that as many people as possible should be engaged in constructing a temple in the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. So he went on this mission and he collected sufficient funds to build the temple at the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. Think about this and people were really amazed to see the humility of Bhakti Thakur. He just went just as a beggar, door to door, begging for one rupee to build the temple for Lord Chaitanya. So <coughs> Bhakti Thakur. He was a magistrate, he was high up in the pedestal and from there he just dropped down just as a beggar and he went door by door and he begged to construct this temple. So this is Bhakti <coughs> Thakur. It is mentioned that his character was so down to earth and he had no duplicity and he was morally so intact. All the British people, they used to respect Bhakti Thakur like anything. He, his work was so clear and he was so strict and he was way, way above corruption. He said, it is said he was so magnanimous, he was so charitable, 
and he didn't find fault in anything and anyone and if he had to criticize or if he had to correct someone he would make sure that he is the right person to take the action he wouldn't criticize or he wouldn't correct anyone see bhakti not thakur is an eternal associate of the lord but he wouldn't correct anyone unless and until he find himself at the right time and he is in the suitable position then he would correct someone otherwise he wouldn't correct anyone he ch- see he chastises many all the pseudo incarnations he chastised many other people but he was in the right position and he understood his his duty then he corrected otherwise he wouldn't take a step to correct anyone so all his colleagues or other people they considered bhaktino thakur to be such a gentle person such a nice person everyone like the association of bhaktino thakur and i have to mention definitely about writings of bhaktino thakur because he was a prolific writer he authored around 100 books in different languages it is mentioned if someone can write one book of that caliber then his life is successful just one book but bhaktino thakur authored 100 books and apart from that he composed hundreds and hundreds of poems glorifying the supreme lord including jai radha madhav shila prabhupad instituted chanting of jai radha madhav every day in his temples that is composed by bhakti not thakur so it is such a such a great writer it is mentioned that his main works are krishna samhita chaitanya shikshamrita jai jaiva dharma tattva sutra tattva viveka and harinama chintamani major works about 100 books are there but these are not <laughs> the major works of bhakti not thakur and uh, you know i when i read something i look into the writing style in the sense how coming to how they are coming to the conclusions so if you or how systematically everything is presented i have a natural habit of looking into, looking into it so when i have a look at any of bhaktino thakur's writing one will be amazed how there is a proper introduction how the points are built systematically and how there is a conclusion we can't find any perfect writing than that of bhaktino thakur amazing writer whatever you read of bhaktino thakur is just amazing so systematic you cannot be think you cannot be even more you cannot be more systematic than this such a profound writing and we will see his daily routine then we will be amazed how he managed to do such an enormous task throughout his life they said he was writing till the, the till the last days it is said in the last days even he 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 was even going through his previous works and he was even fine tuning his previous works he was so diligent dedicated and sharp even during his last days so i'll just go through his daily routine which is very inspirational and <laughs> why we are reading the daily routine of bhakti not thakur it is showing the great quality of a devotee who doesn't want to waste even a single moment of his life avyakta kalakam he wanted to glorify the supreme lord all the time it is said 8 pm till 10 pm he used to take rest for 2 hours mm-hmm. 10 pm till 4 am he used to write see 10 pm till 4 am he used to write see these 100 books he wrote when during the night 6 hours during the night <laughs> think about after 2 hours if you try to think something <laughs> forget about writing to, to write something your mind has to be so clear we cannot even think properly something rather we we'll go crazy so 10 pm till 4 am he was writing 4 am to 4 till 4:30 am rest half an hour sleep again then 4:30 till 7 am chanting japa he had solid 2 and a half hours to chant japa he was not just 64 only 2 and a half hours chant japa then 7 am till 7:30 am correspondence 7:30 am till 9:30 am study shastra see 2 hours of study even for bhakti not thakur 2 hours of shastra for bhakti not thakur take into account then 10 am till 1 pm court duties it is said 3 hours right what other british magistrate they would take 1 and a half hours or 2 hours to pass a judgment he would do it in 5 minutes 5 minutes and some of the britishers they became envious of bhakti not thakur they tried to discourage bhakti not thakur but he was least affected by that 
he continued his routine and finally all of them honored and admired Bhakti Thakur. So this is the greatest of Bhakti Thakur. So three hours he performed all the court duties. So he could pass hundreds of cases in you know in one or two days. And 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. refresh at home. 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. court duties again. It was a full day of work. Think about that. <laughs> he was a grasa. He was performing two till five, three, four, five. How many hours of work? Six hours of work. <laughs> How can we complain? Then 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. translate Sanskrit Shastra to Bengali. <laughs> two hours. Then 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. bath. Prasadam. Prasadam was half liter milk, rice and two chapatis. <laughs> so that's it. They said in, a, in summary he used to sleep for, sleep for three hours. Three hours of sleep. Ride for eight and a half hours. And japa and study, that is sadhana, four and a half hours. And work for six hours. So this is the perfect perfection of Grasta life. If <laughs> you read this, you know, we can have a poster and see. Who can follow this? Yeah. This is the greatness of Bhakti Thakur. <coughs> and I had to make a very important point. Bhakti Thakur was so well connected to Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada was so connected to Bhakti Thakur. It is said, he, because he was very innovative in preaching, he wrote English books and he sent to foreign libraries. So, in 1896, Bhakti Thakur sent copies of Lord Chaitanya, his life and presence to McGill University in Canada. So he thought, I can spread the teachings of Lord Chaitanya abroad, away from India, through my books. So he sent it in 1896 and that is the, age, that is the year Bhaktinath Thakur had the deepest desire to spread Krishna consciousness outside of India. And Srila Prabhupada says, that is the year in which I took birth. <coughs> So there is a deep connection between Bhakti Thakur and Shri Prabhupada. So we will understand this further. Three important predictions were made by Bhakti Thakur. Okay. So one is a personality will soon appear, wrote Bhakti Thakur, and he will travel all over the world to spread the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. So that is none other than Shri Prabhupada. Second prediction. Very soon, the chanting of Harinam Sankirtan will be spread all over the world. Oh, when will that day come when people from America, England, France, Germany, Russia will take up Kartas and Pradangas and chant Hare Krishna in their own tongues? Yes. Yeah. amazing, isn't it? He predicted all the, everyone will join and chant Krishna's names. The third prediction. When will that day come when the fair-skinned foreigners will come to Sridhar Mayapur and join with Bengali Vaishnavas to chant Jai Satchinandana, Jai Satchinandana When will that day be? Yeah. So this is the prediction, three predictions of Bhakti Thakur. So it is said, the last days of Bhakti Thakur he spent in Jagannathpuri, many days he spent in Jagannathpuri and as you know Bhakti Thakur's Bhajan Kutir in Jagannathpuri is the Iskon temple now. If you go near Haridas Thakur Samadhi, yeah. we can see Iskon temple there. So that is uh, Bhakti Thakur's Bhajan Kutir. Then, uh, even at the last minutes, uh, Bhakti Thakur spent in writing and he was practically applying the teachings of Harinam Tintamani and Jaiva Dharma in his own life by chanting holy names. He was continuously chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamatra. And uh, one interesting pastime that is, uh, he took Babaji Vesh, Bhakti Thakur, he renounced, before going to Jagannathpuri, he renounced uh, from his family life completely and from everything, and even from active preaching, he accepted Babaji Vesh, just a loin cloth and just a bahruvas, another cloth, just two cloths in his body. And he accepted this uh, Bahar was from uh, Gaur Kishore Das Babaji Maharaj, who is his own disciple. So because Gaur Kishore Das Babaji, he was already a Babaji, so he had the right to give Babaji wish to Bhakti Thakur. So uh, Gaur Kishore Das Babaji, he refused completely to give Babaji wish. He said, you know, I am not qualified to give you Babaji wish. So one time Bhakti Thakur, he went to search for Gaur Kishore Das Babaji. 
So he was searching everywhere. So that time, Gorkishwar Das Babaji, what he did, he went and sat, sat in the house of a prostitute. So Bhakti Nathakur couldn't find him. So after that, Gorkishwar Das Babaji, he went to the public and he loudly started laughing and laughing and laughing. So everyone asked, what happened to you, Babaji? Why are you laughing so much? He said, look at this Bhakti Nathakur. He, he wanted to find me, but he couldn't find me. I tricked him. Because I hid myself in the house of a prostitute. If had I gone anywhere else, he would have found me. But this place, he didn't find me. <laughs> like that, Gorkishwada Babaji he became, he, he became very happy tricking Bhaktinath Thakur. Then Bhaktinath Thakur sent his son, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarai Thakur, to find <coughs> Gorkishwada Babaji. Then Bhaktisiddhanta, he found Gorkishwada Babaji and requested him to come to uh, the place of Bhaktinath Thakur. So, uh, uh, Gorkishwar Das Babaji agreed and he went and where Bhaktinath Thakur got initiated into Babaji Vesh. So, he just wore two clothes, just a white cloth, one copy and one outer cloth, that's it. And from there he started in the, his uh, last bhajan. So, he went to Puri, he was doing his bhajan and from the final days he went to Bhakti Bhavan. Bhakti Bhavan is in uh, Calcutta, in the place of Calcutta, there he performed his final bhajan. And it is said that he finally, he entered the eternal pastimes of Radha and Krishna in 1910. 1910, he entered the eternal pastimes of Radha and Krishna. So it is said that in the uh, eternal pastimes, the original position of Bhakti Thakur is Kamala Manjari. He is a Manjari Gopi, Kamala Manjari, who is an assistant of Srimati Radharani. So, even though he was a Nitya Siddha, he is coming from the spiritual world, he enacted as a seeker, a sadhaka, who would go through different scriptures, who would go through a gradual spiritual evolution and coming up to the right scriptures and started to practice right scriptures and one who would preach and get perfection. He acted as if he were a sadhaka Siddha, but he was and this is the Kamala Manjari. So, I will read a final writing of Bhakti Thakur. He reasons ill who tells that the Vaishnava died when thou art living still in sound. The Vaishnava died live and living try to spread a holy life around. Shila Bhakti Rod Thakur Maharaj Ki Shila Prabhupada Ki Thank you very much for the excellent description. There are a few more things yeah. I come to know. Mm -hmm. uh, Eleven year old when he was, yeah. he wanted to go to orchard to uh, pick fruits. Mm -hmm. Then one of the mother of the his friend told that if you say a round name, yes. then all the horse will disappear. Yeah. And uh, you can pick whatever you want. And you did it and you found it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Can I ask you a power button?